Could you explain your role in the Kansas City, Missouri School District during the time frame of between 1971 and 1997? Okay, from the time frame between 1971 and 1990, I was attending the school. In fact, I started attending in 79 and graduated from high school in 1990. And then after that, after even though I went away to college, I still had some roles within the school district because my mother worked within the school district and I did some work with her. From 1979 to 83, I attended Pershing, John J. Pershing in Kansas City, Missouri, and I transferred in the second grade and I went to middle school at Southeast Middle School. Uh, at the time of 1984 and 85 school year, I was in middle school. Starting at 1986 through 1990, I went to Southeast High School. So those were the time frames that I was in. So to repeat, I transferred in at second grade and from 79, is when I transferred in and went all the way straight through to sixth grade at John J. Pershing. Then I moved on to middle school at Southeast Middle School. And then I finished my education at Southeast High School, starting in 86, graduating in 1990. There were a lot of different programs and a lot of different people that were involved with desegregation and one of the efforts was to try to bus students into the school district and personally it was something that as a student in the school district I was really frustrated with because here I was a student here in the school district and I really felt that a lot of the energy was put towards attracting students to our district and not necessarily taking care of the students that were actually in our district. And so a couple of things that they had during this time is that we had several board meetings and community always is welcome to come to different board meetings in regards to the desegregation programming and those board meetings even as a young child i remember them quite well because they got quite ugly i remember dr julia hill was on the board for a very lengthy amount of time and i remember that it was just a very difficult time it was a time where there was a lot going on a lot of people in the community were frustrated in some instances because busing became something that was a big deal. And I got to experience it as a student. I got to experience this as a child of a parent that got involved in the school district. But then ironically, after I graduated from high school in 92, I started writing for a local newspaper here. And so I actually got to cover it as a journalist in my field to kind of see the other side of it. So it was really kind of interesting to see all of the board meetings and all of the, the te parent teacher meetings and all of the committee meetings and then how students were feeling about being bused and things of that nature. So there were a lot of different factors involved with desegregation. Well, on one hand, integration is important, and the community understood that. The community understood that we really want to have a richer culture, and so in doing so, integration is definitely something that's needed. The issue that a lot of people in the community had, including myself as a student, my cousins who also attended school with me, and our parents, was the way that people went about enacting desegregation and the big picture was the busing so for example i used to walk to school when i started at pershing 
I got together with a group of kids. Pershing was right down the street. We're walking to school. You know everybody in the neighborhood. You're going to school with people in the neighborhood. And not only just the people that you're going to school with in the neighborhood, but we knew their families. Everybody on my block that I grew up with knew everyone. We knew all the parents. We knew the family when they visited. We knew all the kids and we all played together. Desegregation changed that in a lot of aspects in that now you're being bused out to other places and now people are being bused into your places. And so the community, that was a big issue because it's not just people that are in the community that are going to your school. So there are, were instances where people didn't know other people in the community. There was that kind of lack of feeling of feeling safe. And then I had a couple of friends that actually were bussed out to other schools. So they're not getting that experience of walking to school together. And that was an issue with the community. Well, again, there were some positives in the sense that you want to expand, you want to attract people to your school, you want to attract people to your classes. But the other part is that we had some amazing instructors. And unfortunately, with the instructors at that part, at that point, it wasn't so much that we're focusing in on all the instructors and as much as that we're focusing in on attracting other people. So the test, ITBS was a big thing that was going on during my time when I was in school. And really there was a huge push for the standardized testing. There was a huge push for everybody having this sameness and making sure that we're all doing all of the same things. and. It really cut into the creativity that instructors brought to the school. I remember all of my instructors when I was in grade school. I had Miss Tomlin, I had Miss Jones, who was my favorite teacher in the third grade of all time, really. I had Miss Clay, I had Miss Christensen, and I had Mr. Lumpkins. And so I remember all of my teachers when I was in elementary school. And one of the reasons why I loved my teachers while I was in elementary school is that they had that creativity and they really got a chance to know the students and work towards the students. Desegregation had a lot of great pieces to it, but one of the bigger pieces is that everything started to become more standardized. So those creative thinkers, they didn't go away, but as educators, they didn't always feel appreciated. Why can't we appreciate the educators that we have right here in the schools dealing with the students in this community right now? Why do we have to standardize things or make it better or do other things to attract other students and honestly other students of other races to come here? Why can't we cultivate what we have right now and make it better? So that was, uh, from what I could understand as a child, some of the issues that the educators had to deal with. And then later on, when I got older, I went to, as I stated earlier, I went to Southeast High School. And when I started Southeast High School, William Herring was the president. And he wasn't just known at Southeast High School, he was known in the community. I wanted to go to Southeast High School for not only because it was a good school, but because my cousins went there, my Aunt Kim went there, and there was a lot of pride in going there. And William Herring was at the helm of the school, and he was really a force to be reckoned with. He was someone that really helped to build up the community, especially in that area, because he wanted students to respect themselves and to expect respect and to carry themselves like knights and ladies as we were with Southeast High School. And he set a precedent. And one of the factors with desegregation is that 
for people that are familiar with Southeast High School and familiar with William Herring and ha Heron and have people that have already gone through that school and have so much pride in that, desegregation, you're having people that in, at the time it kind of felt like outsiders coming in to come to the school that don't really understand and appreciate the history. They don't understand the whole idea about the round table and how you never touch the round table. You never even get close to the round table. A speck of dust better not touch the round table. It was a big deal and it was a sense of respect. and. For a lot of instructors, a lot of just the basic educators at especially Southeast High School, they could feel that as the years kind of went by during my high school years, the respect started to fade away because people were brought in. They didn't appreciate the history. They weren't really part of it anymore because they're coming from a different community. So that was a big deal and it, it made a big difference. And then later on as an as someone that was writing stories about the school board, then you definitely I went to the meetings and you definitely get to hear what the teachers have to say. And one of the things was about the standardized testing and how there's this big thing of sameness. And then there was a big talk about magnet schools. And there were, there were a lot of, lot of arguments going on during that time. And so I think educators really kind of felt like they were caught in the crossfires of that. Well, there was the idea of getting to, we knew as students, and we were smart enough to figure this out. If you do all the things to attract other students to your school, then you get good stuff. That's really how we saw it as students. So the bottom line is, is that in order to attract people, you have something to, to attract them with. And so we knew that on one hand, this is great because we can get cool things at our school that other places now have. For example, I worked on the yearbook ever since I was a freshman in high school. And one of the things that I got a chance to do was go to conferences and go to these little workshops and I'm going to workshops at Shawnee Mission and I'm going to workshops that are in Ruskin and I'm seeing other school districts and seeing all the wonderful things that their students have at their fingertips and so Essentially, as students, we really kind of understood that, okay, if we're gonna attract other students, which really was other races, which specifically were Caucasians to our school district, then we have to have something to attract them with. And so we kind of understood that concept and appreciated the fact that it was going to make our school better and make us more competitive in nature and make people want to come to us. But there, was, there were a couple of other feelings regarding that. One, why not make this better as is? Why not appreciate what you have right now? Why make room for others but not appreciate the actual students that you have here? Why does this school get to have these resources and have all of these choices with different books and different programs that are other places? Why can't we have that? Why are we not good enough to have some of these things? So that was a real issue. And when I was younger, I didn't really understand it that much. I remember as a young child in elementary school, my mother and my aunt mainly and, and other parents really lobbying for better books. And as a kid, I didn't really understand the concept of that. Now I'm an educator, I totally get that. Why is it that school A has all of these new crisp books and we don't? The interesting thing about desegregation that I think kind of worked against it is that it opened the curtains to what others have. In the 
at the beginning of it, when you're first starting out and when you're young, you don't know. You don't know what other schools have to offer. You don't know what other programs, other students are enjoying and benefiting from. But as we started to really add in other cultures, other races, other viewpoints, then you hear things like, well, you know, at this school, we're getting computers. At this school, we had new books. Why do we have to have used books here? At the other school I came from, there were brand new books. And so as students were thinking, okay, if it's okay for them to have brand new books, why can't we? If it's okay for them to have new gym equipment, why shouldn't we have new gym equipment? So it was an issue. It was an issue in the sense that it's great because we get a chance to meet new people. It was great because there were changes that were made to the schools, not just the schools that I attended, but it also really opened our eyes that we're not like every other school district. We don't have all of the same resources as other school districts. Education should be universal. So if they have those resources, why shouldn't we? So it really made us as students open our eyes to what other students have and we wanted those same things. So I think towards the end, myself and several of my friends and some of my classmates, this wasn't always the, the whole idea of desegregation was not always well received because we just kind of felt as though, yeah, we're letting other people in, but we're at the end, we don't have all the same resources and we're not treated the same way. I was a good student and realistically, if you're an athlete or you're a good student, you get on committees. So I was on committees. I started getting involved with student government when I was in elementary school. I started really getting involved with my schools. And especially when I went to high school, I was involved in the beta club. I was involved in the honors club when I was in middle school, but then when I went to high school, that honors club kind of turned into the beta club. And so with desegregation, there were several levels that I kind of got involved in. On one level as a student, I got a chance to see what other students were receiving because I got a chance to go to conferences and meet with other students and do different things with students from other school districts. And so one of the things that I did along with other people that were in the same predicament as I was, we came back to our school and said, hey, they have this, we want this, what do we have to do to get it? On another hand, with desegregation, we were for it in the sense that no one should be denied an education. It should not have to be all sameness. We should not all have to be the same race. And everyone should be able to go wherever they want to go to receive an education. So we were fundamentally in support of that. But I will say that during the time of desegregation, there was also magnet schools that were coming up and there was also how many just a lot of different changes happening with the schools i know that even after graduation i had a, a friend of mine marcus brown who used to go to Purcell high school when it was just simply Purcell and not the performing arts and there was just a big debacle about moving that school and changing the, the format of it. And I remember going to several school board meetings in response to that and other issues as a student, whether I really wanted to or not earlier on, I didn't want to go to the school board meetings, but my mother was involved with the school board meetings. I grew up in a single parent home and where she went, I went. So I did not appreciate it early on. I felt like it was a waste of my time. But what basically happened is that I was there. I started to listen. I started to hear the 
one side, the, the popular side, the, the cool side of desegregation and how you're really attracting people of different backgrounds and you're giving people a choice of where they go to school. But the other part of this was that busing was a big issue. And again, I went to neighborhood schools. I mean, Southeast, technically, I did not get a chance to walk that much to Southeast because we were a little bit farther from Southeast, but I still, if I missed the bus, I still was able to walk there and make it to school there. And I learned that a few times, but the busing wasn't that big of a deal in my neighborhood, but it was for other students. I mean, I could get to school. School started at 7.20. And I was like most kids, you hop out of bed, you get to school and you can do it pretty much within under an hour. But I had other classmates that were getting up and leaving the house at six o'clock in the morning where it's pitch dark, standing on a corner in a neighborhood they're not familiar with, going to another neighborhood they're not familiar with. And that was a big issue. It was problematic and it just made you feel like this is a problem. And I feel like the part that I played was talking about it, going to the school board meetings, even when I was in school, I spoke up about it. And even when I graduated and was writing about it, I took the initiative on some of those articles and said, we really need to dig deeper and cover more of this and give other people a voice in all of this because it does make a difference. So those are some of the different parts that I played in it. Well, part one of that, what were the academic expectations? The bottom line is, is that the academic expectations were that you take the standardized test and you move on to the next level. That's really the bottom line. And I want to preface what I'm getting ready to say by stating a couple of things. First of all, I remember, I mean, I listed my elementary school instructors but I remember a lot of the instructors I had during my middle school and high school years. And I really think that I had some phenomenal teachers. But I will state that I also was a hardworking student. And I was pretty much a person that was an independent thinker in the sense, and, and I was very motivated. And I personally loved school. So there was that intrinsic motivation that really propelled me to work hard in school. So the core expectations were that you're going to take the standardized test. You're going to do whatever you need to do to study, to study towards the standardized test, take them, do well in school, and then move forward from there and keep moving up the grades until you graduate. That was really the expectation. But, I felt cheated. I felt cheated when I graduated from high school and went to college. I think that it's again important to just point out that I don't really feel like this was due to lack of teaching. I had teachers that pushed you quite far, but I do definitely believe that it was lack of resources that our schools did not have in the Kansas City, Missouri School District, and quite frankly, don't still have that other schools did. And when I went to Mizzou, I struggled. I struggled quite a bit. And I graduated third in my high school. So I wasn't someone that just kind of did my own thing and didn't do what I was supposed to do. I was a very good student. But when I went to Mizzou, I really struggled. I struggled very hard to keep up and I felt very let down in the educational system in the sense that when I came there, I had other peers in the same age group that were coming from other schools that had taken a lot of different college classes. I did take some college classes while in high school, but they were far advanced. I started taking mine really towards the end of my junior year, but some of the students that I knew had been doing dual credit or 
a form of dual credit and they had several classes under their belt. They had other programs that they got involved in. There was other, there was money available, so they had other avenues. And it was very much a wake up call. It was really disheartening because I honestly felt as though, why didn't we have these opportunities while we were at school? Why didn't we have these resources? If you want the schools to be so competitive and if you want the schools to do well and the students to do well, then where are the resources that other students are getting? Why am I just now hearing about this? I mean, I had classmates that had traveled and we're not talking that we go to St. Louis or go to Chicago. I had other classmates that had traveled out of the country with their school several times. And that just was not something that was available. I had scholarships, but I didn't receive some of the same scholarships as some of my other counterparts. And I graduated at 3.8, which is a pretty good GPA in comparison with some of my other classmates and in comparison with some of the other students from other schools that went to Mizzou as well, we had either similar GPAs kind of right in the same area and they had more resources. So I absolutely felt that we were shortchanged a bit. And I also felt that we were underestimated too. And I just honestly feel that if you don't have expectations for students and you don't push students to be better than they ever dream, dreamt that they could be, then they will remain stagnant. And I had some wonderful instructors when I was in school, but the instructors didn't have all the resources that they could have had. They, we, the schools didn't have all the resources that we could have had, other schools had, and I definitely think it made a difference. I felt on some instances because I was involved in some programs at my school and I was involved in some sports at school that I got a chance to get to know other people and of other other schools and things of that nature so there was that aspect but I still truly believe that I we were kind of leaps and bounds behind some of our counterparts I mean I personally I met students when I met students when I was in in college that had traveled, that had gone to numerous conferences, that were really conscious about their community and what was going on within their community and really educated about that. And I absolutely had a lot of that, but I really truly felt like there could have been more. I know that I went with one of my girlfriends to college and we we met other we hung out in our dorm with other girls from different schools and you know they would talk about some of their experiences and some of their outlets that they had that we just truly did not have that much of and i think it did make a difference when you're bus to an area you're not familiar with and when you're placed with students you don't know in a culture that you really haven't experienced, then there was a big cutoff. I mean, the reality is, is that unfortunately, in some instances, it became an, an us versus them. Them being the students that are being bused in, nobody knows them, you don't know their family, you don't really see them because a lot of things that we did socially, we did within the neighborhoods. So you built that up. I mean, the, the people that I went to school with that I 
was really close with were either family members or friends. And we did all the same stuff together. We played together, we went to the movies together, we hung out together, we probably got in trouble together. We did everything together. And it's very different if you live in the community and go to school in the community versus if you're bused there. And that was a big difference that you're bused there. And that was a big part of desegregation is that you're standing on the curve at 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. You're bused to a neighborhood you're not familiar with. You're placed in with people that come into class on Monday after having spent the whole weekend together and been over each other's houses. So you really can't get involved with that dialogue. And then after school, you're bused home. And so there really isn't that interaction. My son goes to a school that's not in our neighborhood, but I don't bus him, I drive him in. And so by driving him to the school, then I have, I have that flexibility to let him hang out afterwards. And we have that flexibility of him spending time with people in the neighborhood. And he has family in the neighborhood. And so there is that connection. For a lot of students that were bused in, there was not that connection. If you're sick, you can't just call grandma down the street to come and get you. It's, you basically are gonna stay in with the nurse until your parent takes off work to come and pick you up. And so it, it was very different. And to this day, right, wrong, or indifferent, I remember the kids in the neighborhood more than I remember the kids that were bused in. And I think really it was, it was a lot about community, sense of community, and that in the same neighborhoods you do things together. So that made a huge difference. Well, first, I think that the students still need to be pushed. I think that students need to see what opportunities are out there. And that is still an issue with schools, in my opinion. I'm a parent, my son goes to the school district, goes within the Kansas City, Missouri School District. I'm an educator and I took a course where I traveled overseas and I looked at other educational systems and studied that for a while. And the biggest difference is that there's opportunity. There needs to be more opportunity in the Kansas City, Missouri School District. I think it is a wonderful school district. I think that they're really starting to kind of come back to themselves. Accreditation is a big deal. My son goes to a Montessori school, so they are accredited, but there absolutely is that concern. What happens after he's done with elementary school? Where is he gonna go? Is he gonna be accredited? So accreditation is, is a big piece of the puzzle, and it's sickening that the Kansas City, Missouri School District has had that ebb and flow of accreditation. The other part of that is Realistically, I, I would like to see students continue to be pushed and encouraged more because I think that that only helps to build a stronger student and a stronger person. I know that when I met with other school, other students from other parts of the world, they were taking trips and their minds were being open and they were being introduced to new things and I want to see that continue in the school district. There absolutely is some of that, but there's not enough of that. And another piece of the, I think a bigger chunk of this puzzle is that there is way too much violence in the urban core. And even though schools can't stop that, you become a part of it if somebody in your neighborhood is shot over the weekend. And to brush that under the floor and not deal with it only makes that problem exacerbate. Violence is something that is happening in communities and it is definitely affecting children 
in the Kansas City, Missouri School District. Children should be able to feel safe on bus stops. They should be able to feel safe in schools. They should be able to be pushed to do their very best and dream beyond what they think that they can be. And I'd like to see more of that. But I also think that it would be great if they had more sessions or summits on creative problem solving at school. I think that that needs to be brought into the fold of their education because students are not immune to what's going on. They see what's going on with the violence. They hear what's going on in the news. You never know what's going on in their own families. And that's the baggage that they're bringing to their class. And so I really think that we need to address it. And I honestly don't feel like it's addressed enough. And so how can a child really excel in school and do the best that they can if they're scared to stand on the bus stop, if they are scared about what's going to happen on their bus, if they're worried about what's going to happen in their school. Is this the day where somebody snaps and brings a gun to school and shoots up the place? And if you don't address it, and if you don't try to take measures to do something about the violence to try to curb it in some way, shape or form and teach children at a very young age about things like conflict management, then all they're going to do is grow up and imitate what they're seeing already in their communities. And so I really think that that the curriculum, I'd like to see some changes in curriculum being made to really reflect the world that we're living in. And curriculum, there have been some changes, but it's still a little antiquated. So I like to see that kind of stepped up a little bit. Well, the last thing I just wanna add is that I am not a negative person by nature, and I know that some of my responses were negative, and I just want to clarify. The bottom line is that I'm an educator. I did do well in the school district, and I have more fond memories of Kansas City, Missouri School District than not. I do think that education is extremely important, and I do think that desegregation is important. You should be able to go anywhere to go to school, but I don't believe that you need to force someone to come out of their neighborhood to go to another neighborhood to be with students that they're not bonding with if that's not what they want. And I think for me, that was a, a large chunk of desegregation is that for some periods of time, it felt like it was forced upon people as opposed to being something that was a choice. And the reality is, is that when you take choices away from people, then they react and they also feel helpless and learn helplessness is something that we never need to see in this community or any community. And so that's part of the reason why I made some of the statements that I did, but I do want to just end and say that a lot of a, lo a lot of who I am today is because of the education that I received and the educators that I came in contact with. And I love teaching and I love education. And so I, I think that that is an important piece to that puzzle that I want to end with and not just say that it was all negative.